Hey class, it's Mr. Duffy again, and it's time to talk about reapportionment. Uh, reapportionment is a method to redraw congressional district lines to reflect the shifts, the trends in population changes throughout America over the period of about 10 years. Okay. Now, it's also referred to as redistricting. And uh, as you can see from this map here, the uh, blue represents states or areas, counties, where people move to, whereas the red represents where people are moving away from, where the population is being lost in a particular area. And this is, again, this is a map reflecting the percentage change in population, but the more intense the blue or the red, the more or the higher the percentage of people moving around. Now you might be asking yourself, self, why is this important? Why do we have to spend time talking about this, Duffy? Well, it is really important because it's a it, it's it's something to equalize representation. Remember when we talked in the first unit, we talked about. Um, equality of opportunity and this idea of the rule of law and we talked about these ideas and you gotta remember that equality of representation is a really important idea too. Um, it only affects House of Representatives members. It doesn't affect the Senate and the first question I want you to address on the Google form is why aren't US senators affected by reapportionment or redistricting? Okay and I think if you think about it for just a couple minutes you'll it'll totally make sense okay now if it does if it doesn't occur to you keep watching and maybe you'll be able to figure out from the following example let's say this rectangle is a state okay and it has four congressional districts one two three four now let's say that the what six million seven hundred and fifty thousand people that live in this state have never enjoyed reapportionment of their uh, districts to reflect where people live. What you might end up is a situation where in one congressional district there's 250,000 people living in it, another has half a million, another has one million, and, a, and the fourth district is five million people living in it. Now is that equal representation? Because there's only one congressman that represents these five million, one that represents these 250, one that represents these 500, and one that represents these one million. Is that fair? Is that equal representation? I mean, where would you want to live to maximize your representation from your congressman? In a district with more people or in a district with fewer people? And if you think about it for a second, it's going to completely make sense that you want to live in the state with the, or in the district rather, with the fewest number of fellow constituents or fellow citizens. Right, because it maximizes your representation. Well, that's not fair. Okay, and the founding fathers put into place this process involving the Census Bureau. Every ten years, the Constitution requires that the Census Bureau go out and count how many people there are in America and where they live. Now, again, statistically speaking, they don't go out and count every individual. All right, they get a they get a broad sample size, and then they extrapolate the numbers to figure out where people are living, where they've been moving over the past ten years. All right, and then they take the total population. Right now, it's you know, let's say it's three hundred and seven million, and they divide the total population of the United States by four hundred and thirty-five. Now, why do they divide it by four hundred and thirty-five? Yes, that's because it's this. That's how many congressmen, how many people are in the House of Representatives. Okay, there's 435 districts across America, each one with one congressman representing them. Okay, now this figure, which right now is just over 700,000 people, this figure determines the number of Americans that live in each congressional district. The Census Bureau then totals up the number of people that live in each state, and then tell each state, look, over the past 10 years, you've gained population, you've lost population. In each state, you now know how many congressional seats it has. So let's say you live in a state with just over 7 million people living in it. 
Well, that state is going to have 10 congressmen because there's 700,000 uh, people that live in each congressional district. The state has a population of 7 million. 7 million divided by 700,000 is 10. Now, what happens? Next, the states have to redraw the, the congressional district lines. But let's talk about this effect. Before we get continue on with the process, I want to show you a pair of maps. One map reflecting the effects of reapportionment from the year from the 2000 census. That's this map. And then I want to show you the effects of reapportionment from 2010. That's this map. Again, what trend is evident from looking at the reapportionment maps from 2000 to 2010? Answer that in the Google Doc and explain your answer. Okay, I want you to take a moment, answer that Google, answer that question in the Google form. What is what trend is evident from looking at the reapportionment maps from 2000 and 2010? Okay, you might want to talk about what states are being affected. You don't have to list them, but tell me maybe in what areas of the country are benefiting from uh, population shifts and what areas aren't. Is there a trend over time? Over the past 20 years, are there trends that you can detect? Talk about it a little bit, okay? Pause the video and do that. Okay, now I've assumed you've paused the video, answered that question, now we're going to move on and continue with this process, all right? Census Bureau tells each state how many people live in each state. Uh, they tell them how many congressional districts they that they get. Now it's up to each state legislature to redraw the district lines. They redraw the district lines for Congress, that's the House of Representatives, for the state legislature, and what those lines represent are the addition or loss of seats. Okay, if you live in a state like Illinois, which used to have 20 seats, 20 congressional seats and it loses a congressional seat because other states are growing in population and Illinois is either staying the same or losing population, then they're gonna lose congressional seats. Well, that means you gotta redraw the whole map to reflect and subdivide Illinois into 19 districts rather than 20, okay? And of course, that affects the state legislature as well. Well. Look, not everybody's going to agree with what that map should look like. And so there's court challenges and arguments over whose map, what map should we use for each state. Okay, to assure it's being constitutional, that the map is a constitutional map, and that it's fair. Okay, now challenges can be brought in state or federal court. Um, and look, with the appeals process being what it is, if the issue is big enough, it could end up in the U.S. Supreme Court. There was a case coming out of Texas that ended up in the U.S. Supreme Court not terribly long ago, a couple years ago. Uh, there's actually been a couple that have come out of Texas dealing with reapportionment, okay, as an example. Now, what can be taken into consideration when determining whether a map is um, constitutional or not? Well, the U.S. Supreme Court over the past couple hundred years has decided lots of cases involving reapportionment. All right, one of the one of the bedrock principles was contained in this case, Westbury versus Sanders. Okay, Westbury versus Sanders stands for the proposition that the same, uh, roughly the same number of people must be in each district. I'm sure you've heard the phrase "one man, one vote." Okay, and this principle of representation comes from this case, Westbury versus Sanders. All right, and basically it stands for the idea that congressional districts should be roughly the same size in population, all right, because that equalizes representation amongst all the people by their congressmen. Now, a second principle is the idea of keeping communities together. You want to avoid uh, spreading people out or splitting up communities, okay? When I say communities, hey, look, that, that's really a, a purposely vague idea. Are you talking about a community of, of like, a, an actual town? Are you talking about a community of people? Um, 
what kind of, quote, community are you talking about? And the answer is yes, maybe. Because it depends on each court case is going to look at these issues differently, all right? You want to avoid what's referred to as gerrymandering, okay? Gerrymandering is the process of creating districts that are non-contiguous. Contiguous just means that uh, are, are solid, compact districts. Gerrymanders kind of stretch and meander. These districts are kind of all over the place. As you can see on this map, this is the original gerrymander. It was, it was drawn for or on behalf of a guy named Eldridge Jerry back in like 1790. All right, and this is a, the state of Massachusetts. And as you can see, his district stretched all the way up the west coast and then over the, across the northern counties. All right, it's a crazy looking district. All right, and I guess the point is that they called it, they were saying, well, it looks kind of like a salamander and then it wasn't a salamander, it's a gerrymander because it's for Eldridge Jerry. Anyways, this idea of trying to avoid gerrymandering has been a pernicious problem throughout the centuries, okay? Now, when when can you gerrymander? Because it's allowed in certain circumstances. Well, there's one thing that, we, that the Supreme Court has made clear, that race and ethnicity of a population is not allowed to be considered for gerrymandering unless a compelling state interest is shown. All right, you've got to have a really good reason to gerrymander and create a congressional district based on the race or ethnicity of the people living in it. All right, and of course, I'm sure you can imagine a circumstance in a post-Civil War era that would um, call for uh, a black majority or Hispanic majority uh, district. But the, con the U.S. Supreme Court has said past discrimination is not a compelling state interest. You have to show present discrimination to justify gerrymandering based on race or based on ethnicity. All right, And that's from a, a, 19, uh, 90, a, a case out of the 1990s called Shaw versus Reno. Reno was the uh, attorney general at the time for Bill Clinton. So what can be taken into consideration? Again, well, political preference of a population can be considered when redistricting. So you can look at what, how many Republicans and Democrats live in a congressional district, and you can take that into account when you are redistricting uh, as a result of a census. So you can create a gerrymandered map based on polit political reasons where the Republicans and Democrats live. Okay, now, the last map I want you to look at are these um, congressional maps from Illinois. And I want you to take a look at these and then finish the video and finish off the last couple questions on the Google Doc form. Look at the congressional districts of Illinois. This first map shows, um, this map shows the state of Illinois in all of its grandeur. And something that should jump out at you is that, boy, not a lot of people live downstate, do they? Okay, because you can see that where the action is, is in Chicago and the Collar Counties. That's where most of the people in Illinois live. How do you know that? Because the congressional districts are really, really geographically small. Here is the Illinois' 4th Congressional District. Think that's gerrymandered? You better bet your bottom dollar it is. Why? Why do you think that is? Answer those last couple questions in the Google Doc, and I'll see you in class tomorrow. We have some activities involving gerrymandering. See you guys.